what is this about? The normal, if I want to dis the normal way of defense, if I want to defend my children, I stand in front of them, protect them with a gun or with whatever weapon, and don't let a cannibal who wants to eat them get to my children. That is the normal uh, philosophy of defense. But mesmerized by uh, the atomic bomb, which was thought to be the ultimate weapon, the uh, American military establishment uh, came up gradually with a doctrine, and the history of this is well described in a book called Shall America Be Defended by General Graham. They came up with a doctrine of mutual assured destruction, which says uh, in this analogy, uh, I will not protect my children. Here they are, but if you eat three of my children, I will eat five of yours. Well, at first sight, this looks, why not? You know, this is a deterrent strategy. That this is not only an immoral way to protect and defend, but that this is a militarily nonsensical way of defending your children or whatever you want to protect is soon apparent because the cannibal says, well, that's an interesting theory. I've never heard that before and uh, the Russians who, who were, you know, the cannibals have never bought this. And they say, what is this fence for then in this, uh, in this case? So this quasi defender says, you're right, this ABM fence, let's call it, has no use. Let's keep our children mutually as hostages. And he signs a sold one treaty, and uh, you take your fence away, I take my fence away. And the cannibal starts digging holes to hide his children, to evacuate them there. And uh, the good man says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm uh, evacuating my children just in case you do want to attack them. But you signed an agreement that we would hold our children hostage to each other. Yes, but the agreement talked about the fence. It said nothing about evacuation, civil defense. So the man says, yes, you're right. To which the cannibals, of course, will say, this guy is not playing stupid, he is stupid. <laughs> and what the danger is, is that he will take a rock and in a first strike, knock out the good man's teeth so that he has no weapons. And then he will say, look here, man, I have my teeth, you don't. Give me your children for nothing, because otherwise I will kill them. And here comes the big tragedy, because he says, because I am the gentleman, I do not eat children. You, the dirty imperialist, you are a cannibal, you eat children. And if you look at this analogy which I have thought up, you will find a good parallel because if you look at the ways in which the Soviets keep their army totally with any individuality and urge for self-preservation suppressed, that they're willing really to die for their country in human waves and whatnot, how is this done? In part, of course, it is done by terror. And I could tell you many things about this, how this is done. In the, in the Soviet army, because you're looking at an ex-captain of uh, uh, the Czechoslovak army, which is just a, uh, another division of the Soviet army, regulations and everything is the same. The X is easy to understand, because uh, uh, obviously when I was sentenced uh, to whatever it was, hard labor in absentia for the crime of not returning to my country in time as the government decreed, so. Uh, I take it, or I hope at least, that I also lost my rank. 
So the X is easy, uh, easy to understand. More difficult for you maybe to understand what was I doing in the Czechoslovak army as a captain. Well, over there there is no draft because uh, there is no need to play lotteries who goes and who doesn't go. Only two types of people don't go. Those under 15 and those under 18 and those over 60. Everybody else, if he has no legs, he can sit and rub a stamp. If he has no arms, he can carry something in his mouth. Everybody goes into military service. In any case, let me get back. I, I'm sorry to get myself lost. Uh, let me get back to this. How do they achieve this? In part, by terror, punishment, and so on. But in part, also, by instilling their soldiers by a false ideology, but by an effective ideology. And one of the things that they tell them is we don't do things like uh, mass killing a population by bombardment. That is what the Americans do. We go against their missiles, against their military targets. So here you have something which is not only militarily false, but directly plays into their hands in raising the morale of their soldiers. Uh, how far the uh, uh, military establishment and the government in general has become mesmerized under past presidents, and to this day there is still no clear alternative uh, strategy visible. You can see almost every day. In civil defense, it has come to this, that in uh, nuclear power, America, the originator of nuclear power, has to learn breeder technology from the French. And uh, in civil defense, it has come to that, that America has to learn from the Soviets because the Soviets, immediately after Salt I, began a grandiose civil defense program, in my analogy, of hiding the children. And one of the things that uh, they pondered was, uh, what do we need most to survive? Number one, skilled labor. Number two, machinery. How do we protect machinery in their textbooks? For example, say, uh, use uh, scrap metal filings in uh, plastic bags, put it over the machinery, bury the thing in some nine feet of uh, earth, and the thing will survive anything but a direct nuclear hit. Well, there are some people left, and now they're getting just a little money for civil defense, and they tried this out in the Nevada desert by simulation, by TNT close enough. You, you can calculate how much closer you must come to have the same effect. And they saw, by golly, the Russians are right. This works. This will save the machinery. And uh, at the recent hearing, uh, they testified to this. And you would think uh, that uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee would say, well, it's not much, but thank God that you did at least that to try out uh, how we can survive in, in uh, cases like that. Instead, uh, one of the lights of the clan of American intellectualoids, Senator Alan Cranston, had these remarks to a Mr. Jones who testified on these experiments. What happens next if nuclear war becomes thinkable? If it's thinkable, might it not be tolerable, acceptable? And if winnable, what? Desirable? I question the fundamental judgment of Mr. Jones. Well, if you translate what Senator Cranston says, if you translate it from Potomakis into English, what he is saying is don't think the unthinkable, don't think the thinkable. I am secure because I'm defenseless. <laughs> now then. This fear, this thinking the unthinkable that is being played up in bombs has all one common idea. Defense is impossible. There is no defense. And I will explain in a moment why this 
is false, and I will give both the technical reasons and the moral reasons why this is totally false. But you can easily test the hypocrisy of these people for things like the neutron bomb. The neutron bomb is a purely defensive weapon which was introduced only for defending Europe because the rationale behind it was this. If the Russians, who have a vast preponderance in conventional weapons, especially in their tanks, decide to attack Western Europe, then NATO can do nothing or very little but use the nuclear deterrent. And if they use this, if they use not the deter deterrent but the actual nuclear bomb, they will destroy the country of the defenders, mainly West Germany. So to make this a little more realistic, a neutron bomb was developed which does not destroy, uh, certainly not to the extent uh, of an equivalent ordinary nuclear bomb, uh, buildings and properties, but uses the energy in uh, radiation that will penetrate the armor of the tanks and will kill the crews. Defense without destroying the country of the defenders. In fact, it was even suggested uh, to make a treaty that nuclear weapons shall not be used except on uh, one's own territory, meaning the neutron bomb. Now, this purely defensive weapon, which does not make any sense for anything else, was attacked with a fervor that we have never seen before, if you remember. Senator McGovern, who I believe then still was a senator, said this is a truly dehumanizing weapon and this is the ultimate folly and they're against it and so on. And the Russians uh, said, we are willing to give up the Newton bomb if you are and so on. Well, this, of course, is a very transparent case why all this uh, giving up and why this defensive weapon was so horrible for one very good reason that it is a defensive weapon and that comrade Brezhnev has no use for such, such a weapon. He, can, you, he, can, he needs a defensive weapon like they say in Czech, like a pig needs a tuxedo. This hypocrisy, there are other ways to test the hypocrisy. If you want to see the hypocrisy, ask them, assuming that the Russians are a good guy and that they will treat us Americans, their adversaries, better than they treated their friends and comrades, the Czech government, two days after they kissed them and embraced them and gave each other flowers in 1968. Let's assume that they will treat their adversaries better than their friends, their good guys, and so on. All this equivalent megatonnage, these tons of plutonium, watch their expressions if you ask what you're going to do with this plutonium. Man, at last we will have electricity too cheap to meet it. And watch them to see what they say to that, you know, what, what will you, how will you get rid of this plutonium.